Well, good morning. Gosh, it is good to be here together at St. Peter's Church. If you haven't met me yet, my name is Gage, and I get to lead our students here at the church. Um, and today's a special day for me, uh, not just because I get to be up here uh, leading the welcome for the first time, but this is also going to be my first week uh, in the 11th hour, which is our programming for students that we do on Sunday mornings. It rotates high school and middle school, so if you're in high school, this week, you are absolutely open invite, welcome. We'll all experience it together like a new thing. If you're middle school, hold tight. Next week is your week. But uh, with that being said, can we stand together as we read our psalm, as we enter into worship this morning? And uh, let's put some guts in it, yeah? Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's sing together this morning. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. We're going to worship together for a few minutes. So let's jump right in. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Let's say that again. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Oh, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Oh, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us a stay. Give us a stay, daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them and lead them not into temptation, but to deliver us from the evil one. Oh, let your kingdom come. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us a stay. Give us a stay of daily bread. Forgive us. Forgive us. As we forgive. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Oh, let your kingdom come. Oh, it's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours. Again. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. Forever and ever, the kingdom is yours. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Oh, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Let's sing that again. Oh, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. 
let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart on earth. On earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart on earth. On earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. It's all glory and all honor and all worship be yours. It's yours, it's yours.
again. a good deal. I, I love what Tozer says. We've said it here before that what you think about God is the most important thing about you. So I'm think about what you think about God is the most important thing about you. Like your life flows from that state, that place. And there are times where, where it's hard to trust God's good. It's hard to believe I'm loved. And when that equation goes wrong, I can end up in all sorts of places and shame and brokenness and fear and anxiety. And so this morning, we've gathered to reclaim all that stuff, that God's good and I'm loved. And that you can go a long way in life if you know that. You really can stand in a lot of places when you know that. And so tonight, today, we want to stand in that, that he's good and that you're loved. And so I just want to invite you to close your eyes. And whatever brokenness you hold this morning, whatever disappointments, whatever fears, whatever, whatever dashed hopes, frustrations, and struggles... This morning is just an invitation to be reminded that he's good and you're loved. And that changes the way we show up in life. So whatever it is that you're holding that, that just isn't what you long for it to be or it doesn't look the way it, it maybe should or could, we just offer that back to a loving God who walks with us. who does not condemn us, who does not walk away from us, but walks with us, that meets us in that valley and grabs our hand and walks with us out of it. You have nothing to protect and nothing to prove this morning that he will do the work and he will invite you on a journey. And so we join the church across the world in saying to our loving God, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry. We humbly repent through your son, Jesus, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen, amen. You're forgiven. May we walk in freedom with a God who's with us, loves us, and, and is good. 
My friends, peace is here. You don't have to create it or invent it. God gives it freely through Jesus. And so we say, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Turn and greet one another, and we'll call you back in just a moment. Welcome to St. Peter's Church. My name's Turner. If we hadn't had a chance to meet, we have a lot going on here in this community. I'm going to highlight a few of those things. And for the rest of these, feel free to look on our website, sign up for our e-news, check out the before and after slideshow with the announcements on there. But I want to highlight a few of them. First of all, today, after the second service, I know you're in the first service, obviously. After the second service, we are going to invite you to come back. We really want you to come back. We're going to have an all-church celebration. There are going to be some snacks, some goodies. More importantly, I think there's some great news to share. We're going to find out where we've landed, how close we've gotten to that, that ESI number, that every square inch property development number that we feel like God has been leading us through. And truthfully, I have no idea where we landed. I do not know. I think that they kept that from me on purpose so I can build the suspense a little bit with you. So we want you to all come back because I think we're going to find out there. Um, so please, that's after, this, after the 11 o'clock service. Also, this, later this afternoon, we have a mother-son date night coming up. That's ages fourth, four years old all the way up through fifth grade. Um, if you haven't signed up for that and you are of, of age and you fit that demographic, come to it. I think it's going to be a blast. Then on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, and then every other Wednesday from that point on, um, Rennie and the women's ministry team are hold, hosting something called In His Presence, um, just a time to rest to listen to the Word of God, to listen to some music, and just be still for a moment to start your day. So I'd encourage you to check that out starting this Wednesday. Then, not this Wednesday, the following Wednesday, one of my favorite things we get to do, we get to eat together. We're having the table. The table is coming back for the fall for this particular month. Go ahead and sign up for that. Don't wait. Go ahead and sign up. Bring your favorite dish, casserole. You can make barbecue. I mean, bring whatever you want. Go ahead and sign up for that. If you have any questions, reach out to me. And, of course, we want you to find Find your people here. We want you to find home here. So we have these little sheets for you. These are our open groups. Groups anybody can come to. Um, grab one of these sheets. They're out in the lobby. Check it out. And if you have questions, feel free to contact me. With all that being said, I'd like to invite our reader forward as we continue to worship. Let's listen for the word of God this morning. Our Old Testament reading comes from Ezekiel chapter 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Our gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 21. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. A reading from Ephesians chapter 4. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and greediness. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about, G about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is Jesus. You were taught with regard for your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. 
Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with him you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Roman baths were the defining characteristic of the Roman way. They were at least one of, if not the defining characteristic. Um, Rome wanted you to want to be Roman. Like by the time they conquered your village, the hope was that we are bringing you a kind of life you could have not gotten without us. So the idea of being colonized by Rome in the ancient world, such as they did in Ephesus, by the time they conquered you, you were like, this is so much better than what we had before. And what they would do is they would appeal to your most base desires and create a culture around that. Now, one thing to understand about the baths is that the baths were not about hygiene. Like when we think about the Roman baths, you think, oh, great, a great place to go and clean myself. And sure, that happened to some extent, but the baths were actually about entertainment. They were about relaxation. They were about social interaction. The baths, most importantly, were about shaping culture. And the culture that the Roman baths shaped in the ancient world was a culture of sensuality. And when you begin to understand the culture of the Roman baths and what it brought to the cities in which Rome conquered, it helps you to understand the text that we're going to see today. There's actually bath kinds of language that you would use in the baths, and Paul is reappropriating them and putting them into this text. So when the people of Ephesus are hearing this read to their church in their house, they're beginning to connect the dots between the baths. Now, here's how the baths work. Women, when they would get up, they would utilize the baths in the morning. They were public baths available of any socioeconomic status. You could come and afford them. Many of them were free. So they were sort of like a way in which Rome was saying, come be like us and we'll make it financially feasible for everybody, right? So women would get up and they would go visit the baths in the morning. Some would stay, most would return home and begin their work. The typical male would begin his work around sunup. And around midday, his work was done. Around noon, the typical Roman male in the ancient world, such as in Ephesus, would leave work, would go to the baths, and spend hours in the afternoon there. Every single day. That was the rhythm. Work, baths. Work, baths baths. That was the rhythm in the Roman world. And when you're there, you can unwind, you can hang out with friends, you can network, you can drink wine, you can eat food. 
the invitation at these places, like it was the, inv- the invention of the snack bar happened at the back. I'm not even kidding. They had a word for snack bar, which was like the genesis for what we know now as the food truck, right? Thank you, Rome, for that. This idea that you would talk business, you would play games, you would view art, you could exercise, you could get a massage, you could listen to lectures, and you could and would engage with prostitutes. That was the culture of the baths. Sometimes both genders would be present. The baths, for all intents and purposes, were practically, if not fully, in the nude. I love this phrase from a slave trader in Ephesus. This letter we're reading in Ephesians, this was the culture. He said, Tiberius Claudius Secundus, baths, wine, and sex spoil our bodies, but baths, wine, and sex make up life. That's the culture of this world. Here's a bath complex you can actually go to in Ephesus. And you can see up here in my little handy laser here, when you walk this street, so here were like the main streets through the Agora, and you come down over here, you'd see the theater there, which you already looked at. But at the top of the city, at the north part of the city, here were the baths. There's the big structure that you see and you can visit even today. And then available for any social class. When you walked into these structures, sometimes they were multi-tiered, multi-layered, multi-storied, you would have a frigidarium. This was a place that the water was cold, right? Frigid in these places. They found a way to do that. And not just the frigidarium, but the tepidarium. This is a place where you would have a sort of warmer bath. And then you would go eventually to what's called the caldarium, which was the sauna. Or at sometimes they would have hot water. They would have these clay pipes. You can go and visit them today where you can see in these old bath systems, these sort of like little pillars that are on the floor. These were these clay pipes where they would actually have a slave by an open fire piping in warm water underneath the ground onto that floor so that when you stood at it, it would actually like heat up the water. And they had sandals that you would wear as you were in there taking care of hanging out, soaking your body, networking, doing business, et cetera, et cetera. Culture, I want to suggest this morning, it kind of works like this. Culture is like a scented candle in the room. This is a uh, pumpkin spice latte candle, <laughs> which I think personally tastes like potpourri. Like, I don't get that. I don't, I don't get that at Starbucks. Like, I think it's disgusting. And for any of you that drink that, you disgust me. That's how I feel, right? It's awful. Nevertheless, the way culture works is like a scented candle. And and what I mean by that is is that if you're around it enough, you don't smell it anymore. You normalize it. You adjust. Your sensitivities sort of relax. And your body makes space for that. And it normalizes it. And you no longer are used to it. You get used to it. You no longer smell it. Sensuality, I want to suggest, was the scent of the Roman culture. The baths normalize that. I I wonder, what are the candles in the room in our time? What are those things that maybe another time, another place, another culture would come and observe our way and say, "Are, are 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 you kidding me? What are those things we've normalized? Let's hear the ancient text this morning. So I tell you this. Insist on it in the Lord. Remember the first three chapters of this, Paul has gone to great lengths to to let you know just what we have in Christ, the work that he's done in us. And because of that, there's a way. Because of his work, we are called into a, a new way. I insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now that's interesting because this church is now primarily Gentile, mixed with some Jewish believers too. In other words, hey, like, You're still Gentile, like you can't not be Gentile. However, there's a way to your Gentileness that you've been called out of. Don't live like that anymore. Don't live like the candle, that culture that you've come from in the futility of their thinking. We're going to come back to that. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. We're going to come back to that too. Having lost all sensitivity, that's this. Having lost all sensitivity, it's been normalized. Sensuality has lost any sort of sensitivity in life. It's just the way you live. It's just the way we live. It's the Roman way, right? 
having lost all sensitivity to the smells in the room, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity with greediness. In other words, the impurities that we have and carry around, we're almost like there's a never enoughness. It's not like... It's not like pornography, you ever find a place where, okay, I'm good. Like there's this sort of like abysmal sort of chasm that will over the course of your time take you down if you're not paying attention, if you get used to the candle in the room. That's the sort of invitation that Paul is having in this. And I got to be careful here. And here's, here's the thing about this text. The scriptures can be twisted to promote behavioralism. It's this notion that if you mess up, God won't love you. That there's a kind of conditionality to God's love. That if you perform correctly, then... It's almost like um, if, if I walk in a way, then God will work on my behalf to deposit the spirit in my life. It doesn't work that way. The kingdom is like, no, God is at work in you. And because of that, the extension of that empowerment is we can begin to see life in a different color and walk in a different way because of the empowerment of the spirit in our life. It's not performative. It's not like an equation, a transaction where you get salvation or you get the Holy Spirit because you're, you're performing so well. The gospel is the exact opposite. And I think we have to be careful with this text because this text is not about condemnation. This text is about a life of conviction. This text is not about behavioralism. This text is about transformation. Some will hear this text today and it will lead to self-hatred. And that's exactly what the enemy wants for you this morning. For you to hear this text around bitterness and rage and sensuality and all the things that come from this sort of life. And you will internalize in such a way that I'm unworthy, as if we were ever worthy, by the way. And it's exactly what the enemy wants, is a life of self-hatred. The design of this text is to lead you back to the God who loves you. I love the words of the Anglican pastor and pioneer of Alpha, Nikki Gumbel, when he says, I, I think this should be taken so seriously, that God loves you unconditionally, wholeheartedly, continuously. Golly. That God loves you unconditionally, wholeheartedly, continuously. I think so many Christians come from backgrounds you've been so beat down. It's no wonder our hearts, they harden. You've been so beat down with performative Christianity, with looking the part, with acting the part, with saying the right things, with phoniness. And Paul is saying, hey, listen, there's a way you've been called into. And if that's not the way you're living right now, God wants to do a deep work in your life because he loves you unconditionally, wholeheartedly, continuously. Here's what I want to say about this text this morning. The greatest tragedy of this passage is not that we sometimes make really poor choices. And here's the thing we all do. Every single one of us in this room, what we share in common is that we make poor choices at times in our life in all sorts of directions. I, love, I, was, um, I was sitting with an old friend last week um, over lunch and he had, he had really fallen from grace and lost his ministry lost everything. And he said to me, AJ, you know, I wish on our name tags, we just had like our five most prone areas of brokenness. That's, that's how we introduced ourselves. Hi, my name's AJ. I'm broken in these ways. Oh, you too? Oh, good, good, good. Great. So we can like sort of can the phoniness and really get down to business about, about who we are and what we're about, right? Like, I like that. Like this, this idea that maybe we can connect so much, not in our like, like self-actualized personas or our, our self-righteousness, but man, we're, we're all broken and we're all just looking for connection and for someone to, to notice that we're all in this together and that God still loves us and is calling us out of that and into something better. I like that idea. The greatest tragedy of this passage is not that we all make poor choices, even though that is tragic. The greatest tragedy of this passage is what can happen to our hearts and our minds after we make those choices. And that's, that's why I think he's saying, like, there, there, there's a couple directions you can go with this, that as you live life 
and we make poor choices in life, and we all do, it can lead to a futility of mind and it can lead to a hardness of heart. That's the tragedy. That's the real tragedy, I think, that grieves the heart of God. That it can lead to a sort of way that we're ensconced in and almost like cement that dries, that we begin to live in a certain way. That's the greatest tragedy of this text. And when we are there, our shame leads us in one of two directions. Many, and I'll just speak for men, we repress, right? We compartmentalize our life. We don't, we have low integration. Like what happens here on Sunday is not connected to Monday at all in terms of our faith or in terms of our ethics and our life and our vision. That's why so many come into the church today and we don't want to sing. Why? Because our, our minds are futile, our hearts are hard, right? There's no integration between what we're proclaiming on Sunday and life on Monday. And so there's a kind of shame that we can repress. Another thing that we can do is we can run. We run from God. We believe we can outrun the divine. We close off to God's transformative power. Know this, God loves you unconditionally, wholeheartedly, continuously. And if that is true, it means you can stand and face and grow and know that God will continue to walk with you. I like this, this idea of futility of mind. This, in the Greek, it's this word meteotes, which is kind of hard to say. And it's the idea of meaninglessness. Like we begin to believe the lie that what we do with our lives, our bodies, our minds, that it's all meaningless. It doesn't really matter. Eat, drink, be merry. Tomorrow we die. It doesn't really matter. Daily nudity, casual sex, promiscuity, drunkenness. That was the Roman way. And the city of Ephesus drank in the Roman way more than any other city outside of Rome. It was the city that wanted to be like Rome the most. Paul is writing to that church. And Paul is saying this. If, if you live into these choices over time, it leads to shame, which leads to like a futility of mind. Christ has given you eternal meaning. And the text continues to say this, that, however, is not the way of life you've learned. When you heard about Christ and you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to, with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, hang on to that, which is being corrupted by these deceitful desires, by these candles. It's being corrupted and you're not even aware of it. And to be made new in the attitudes of your mind. To put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This language, put off, put on, in the Greek, these are fashion terms. These are about what you do with clothes. This was exactly, there was this room in the baths you would go into. You had all these different rooms you could go to for different sort of social functions and degrees of water, however you wanted your temp or whatever. There's this word in the Greek called apoditarium. And an apoditarium was the changing room. It was the locker room of the ancient world. And you would go in there. Typically, you would hire a slave for a nominal price to like watch your stuff so no one stole it. And it was a room where you would literally take off your clothes and you would put them back on. Now, why does that matter? Because when the original hearers heard this text, immediately they would have thought about the baths. Oh, that's what we do in the Apodotarium. That's what we did in the Apodotarium before Christ. They would have immediately thought of this imagery of the Roman bath system. And he's saying Gentiles like live into this newness of God's indwelling Presence. The invitation is for these people that have come out of this sort of system, this sort of environment, and to say, there's a newness to your life now. It's like Jesus isn't some sort of tack on that you just continue on your way and he just, you just kind of put him in your toolbox. No, it changes everything about us. The New Testament will say we've been given a new mind, a new will, a new heart a new inheritance, a new relationship, a new power, a new knowledge, a new wisdom, a new vision, a new righteousness, a new love, a new desire, a new citizenship, all recorded in a testament called the New Testament, <laughs> right? The whole thing's new. It's not an add-on. It's not a tack. It's a new way of being. It's a new way of seeing. And will we mess up? Absolutely but he will continue to call you into who he already sees you into be. He already sees you from that perspective. And he's saying, I'm calling you over the course of time to go on a walk with me and watch what I will do in your life. God is making all things new and it's starting with you. 
But when you choose the paths of your former ways, futility of mind sets in, meaninglessness, right? And it's followed by something. It's followed by the hardness of our hearts. Porosis is the term in Greek. Porosis sets in, and it's a kind of closeness. This hardness of heart, it, it creates a kind of close, closeness of our hearts, and it closes us to the God who loves us. He will not force us to receive his love. That's what's so fascinating about this all-consuming, all-powerful God is he refuses to invade your freedom. He continues to give you a choice. And he wants you to meet him in that space. But it's sometimes hard to open our hearts. We keep them closed. It's a strategy. I want to use a metaphor really cautiously because um, we're in a moment where, where people's lives have been ruined just north and just sort of west of us. I'm so grateful for the work Eric is doing. Emily's taking that U-Haul up to North Carolina today with things at our church. I mean, just grateful to be a part of a community that cares about that. And I, I want to use this metaphor of this tree. I was, I was driving up from Florida last week, the day after the storm, and, and I was on 95, and there were just trees. If, you, if you've been on the road recently on 95, you just see them. They're just, they're just fallen on the side of the road. And you see these root systems that have come up. I, I want to use a metaphor here in, in, in an opposite way. What, what happens is rain softens the soil, and then wind, it, it blows it down. It's that simple, right? That whatever root system that is, it, it gets sort of, it gets sort of um, wet and, and a sort of, it, gets, it gets pliable. It's the opposite of porosis of the heart. It sort of gets soft, and then the wind comes. And when we make poor choices in life, again, and again, it's like those roots of whatever those choices are, they go further and further and further down into the hardness of the soil of our life. And eventually they get cement, it feels like they get cemented in there. And there's not a lot of movement. And, and I think our hearts can become so hard that when we're in an environment where the wind of the Spirit, I don't know if you've ever been in this space, I have felt it before, and I, I hear people talk about how sometimes you walk into a room or you're with a person or you're at a church and you just sense like God's presence is here. It just feels thick. It feels like there's something available in this room. And it's amazing to me. Like we, we can be in those places where our hearts are so hard and the spirit is moving, but we're insensitive to it. It's like that candle in the room that we're so used to another culture that we don't recognize the freshness of the wind of God because our choices have led these roots to go so deep into hardness of heart. And I think, I think that's why people are really important in our lives. I think other people contribute to God's work in us when my heart is hard and those roots have gone down, and it has been before. When my heart is hard, I tend to isolate. I tend to not want to be in places that actually, like, restore me. Why? Because they'll probably confront what I'm trying to suppress because I'm afraid that all sorts of things, right? Several years ago, I was, um, I was pastoring a church for a long time in uh, New York City, and Elena and I shared a really deep friendship with um, a couple in our church. And he was, uh, he was the executive producer of arguably the most well-known news television show in history. And late one night, I got a text that just said, hey, meet me for breakfast. I need to tell you something. I'll be at the restaurant at the bottom of Rockefeller Center. The next morning, we sat, and he told me that he had been living a secret life and that he was about to lose his job, and he wondered if our church would condemn him. I said, no, 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 we won't. We'll walk with you. And, and just... Um, aside, as, as a pastoral sort of longing, my dream is to be a part of a church that once again is the place for people to find grace and restoration when people make bad choices, because we all do. What if the church became that place again where people could heal and grow? It seems that AA is that place, right? The spirit moves in AA. Why? Because people are honest their need for God, their need for each other, and the, the roots that have gone so deep 
into the soil that are just, it, it, they're just aware that I don't, I don't want that anymore in my life. But I think the most striking confession that he made to me that morning had nothing to do with, with the choices he had been making. He said this to me, and this, is, this haunts me. He said, AJ, I have been in the same men's group for the last 20 years. And I've been lying my way through half of it. That was what was so striking that morning. The community, it doesn't guarantee that you're being honest. Like you can come to church and like do your small group. You can come to men's breakfast with me on Friday morning. I invite you to do that. The food's awesome. And your heart can be hard as stone and just closed. Listen, if that's you today, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. We're afraid to face reality because we're we, we're not sure God's going to meet us there. We're not sure other people are going to walk with us. God loves you unconditionally, wholeheartedly, continuously. And that's not the same to say God agrees with all of our decisions. It is to say the kind of God we're talking about is better than you think. And given this reality it invites us to face anything. And when you fall, he will stand you back up and he will give you a new root system. I want to invite Martin just to, just to play for a second. What I, what I want to do is just pray this morning. Um, I, want to, I want to read Ezekiel over you. There was a promise that happened in the prophet. And after we pray, we're going to come straight to the table and respond by coming to this meal. This promise that Ezekiel once said, hey, when Messiah comes, you'll know it because something else will be available for you that wasn't available for us. Before the new covenant, there we had the old covenant. The old covenant didn't make this available for us. But now people of the new covenant, like in Ephesus, like in Mount Pleasant, like, like in our lives today, there's something available for us if we will face that and receive that. The prophet said this, that God promises this. He says, listen, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I always went like, why flesh? Because God can mold that. God can massage into that and heal that. And, and a stone isn't, isn't, isn't very helpful in the hands of God. And that's our choice as to whether to allow the winds and the rain of the Spirit to come in our lives and blow these things down that have no business in the new life God has given us and to raise us back up that we would walk into the fullness of life. So pray with me this morning, Father. We bring ourselves to you. You're a good, good Father. That's who you are. And we're loved by you. That's who I am. That is, that is the most interesting thing about me is that I'm loved by you. Not how I've messed up, not my resume, not my success, not my failure. The most interesting thing about us is that you love us unconditionally, wholeheartedly, continuously. And so, Lord, for anyone in this room that's just wrestling with shame, with secrets, with compartments, with hardness, with purposelessness that creates a futility of mind. Lord, I just pray for a breakthrough this morning. I pray that there'd be a sense of acceptance and love and grace. And that you would plant people in the lives of others in this room that will walk, that will restore, that will become like Jesus to them. So Lord, I pray over hurts and wounds, brokenness and betrayal. Oh 
Holy Spirit, just as we gather in this place, would your wind come? And will we feel the refreshing of your love? Lord, I pray for breakthrough in this room. As we respond in the table today, I pray that we would sense your love and your goodness, that we would come to you and that you would heal us. In Jesus' name, we ask all of these things. Amen. Friends, we don't earn our place at the table this morning. It is freely given to us. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Holy Spirit, thank you for spiritually making this for us, the body and blood of Christ. May you use it in the restoration that you have planned for us today in the days to come. Amen. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Would you stand as you're able? Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I'd like to invite our servers forward. As you come forward this morning, remember we have gluten-free and our uh, wine is non-alcoholic. But come with hands open, freely receiving what's freely given. From Jesus Christ. Amen. faithfulness oh God my father there is no shadow of turning with thee thou changest not thy compassions they fail not as thou Thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning.
faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And pardon for sin and the peace that So, so 
my life. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so. Oh, you're so good with every breath. Every breath that I am able. I will sing of the good. One more on you. Yeah. Christ in my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken. Well, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. Would he fail now? He won't. No. He won't. I've still got joy. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be. I'm not held by my own strength, cause I built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down, he's faithful in every season. So why would he fail now? He won't.
It's such a joy that we get to worship together and we get to sing together and um, it's such a joy to have such a wonderful music team lead us. Thank you all. Matter of fact, it is such a joy that you could all, you should all consider staying around for the next service and then coming to the all church celebration. No, seriously, I would love it. I'm, you're invited. We want you there. So if you can, if you can make it, come back after this next service. Um, enjoy some light goodies on us and, and participate in this celebration. And now, friends, hear and receive this benediction. May God's presence go with you. May God's purpose be for you. And may God's power move through you in all that you do and to all whom you meet. We go empowered to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.